everybody. Welcome back to the Chasing Edges podcast. I'm your host, Brian Peters. Got an amazing human on this week, Rachel Balkovec. She is a minor league baseball manager in the Yankees organization for the Tampa Tarpons. She was the first MLB female manager in history as well. Along her journey, she was the first female in the strength industry in the MLB as well as the first female MLB hitting instructor, just an absolute trailblazer. And we discuss her whole journey, but all the nuggets are in her mindset, how she continued to learn and grow and shed her skin and continue to be new uh, in the industry as well as redefine her entire career in the industry. And we get into the nuances of that, but we also break down her entire first year, the lessons she learned, what she applied and how she built standards and competitiveness on her team. And then we get into some of her specialties, which obviously leadership is one of those, both her team and personal. But then we get into eye tracking, which is a fun conversation. And then we obviously break down our personal standards. And even we get into the the language disparity in the sport as well and the development of all the players from 18 on whenever they get drafted. It's a really fun conversation. And I hope you enjoy. All right, Rach, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Long time coming. Yeah. This podcast. Yeah, I'm pumped to talk to you. Obviously, you've had uh, your journeys out of control. I love your mindset. And then obviously, you got um, this last first uh, big year um, on your track record now. So I'm excited to rip into that if you're up for it. But uh, how we start the podcast, where in your life right now, are you chasing edges? Where are you learning and growing? Uh, I was just thinking about this yesterday because I'm doing a lot of physical labor. So I I purchased a house this offseason and it's a giant house on a lot of land and I'm learning about how to take care of that. And so I'm just moving a bunch of rock around and using a pickaxe and like using my body in different ways. And so right now I'm learning just in different ways, you know, not not the normal like reading the encyclopedia way, but like the the learn by doing way and I'm learning a lot and it's it's mentally exhausting so I would say currently that's um micro level how I'm chasing engines and I guess macro level in my career just being a new I'm always a new something so I'm always in the beginner mindset because I'm always doing something different so this year was managing um at the minor league level yeah, but what, uh, I mean, there's already a lot to unpack there. Cause I love, well, like how much, how much acreage are we talking about here? Um, it's technically only 1.5, but it, uh, yeah. there's the neighbors aren't, there aren't neighbors really. So though I still am like taking care of a lot more land and learning all that. And, um, there's a wooded area and just, you know, chopping things and moving <laughs> things and wheelbarrows. It's really fun. Hell yeah. I just, I, I love the exhaustion that does come from yeah. that. It's, it's more peaceful for me. Just, I do like the chopping wood and then I've gotten more and more into helping uh, my doc at his farm and stuff. And it's just been medicine for me. But then um, mm-hmm. at the, at the managing level one, I, then like the student mindset, you've always embodied that, like even in your, I mean, I've always respected it in your whole, your whole journey, whether it was shit, learning Spanish to uh, coach, uh, in the minor leagues and that kind of thing. And then you go into the Netherlands and like, you're, you've always just pushed through like what was necessary to be successful in that realm. And I've always thought that was dynamite, but it takes a beginner's mindset. It takes that level of friction on yourself to again, be the beginner again, eternally. And I think that's the best way to embody it. But um, as far as like this, this first year of managing, just cause I think like I, I always try and put myself in other people's shoes and what tactics I would take for like coaching uh, a, a team or being a head coach in that realm. Uh, how t- can you uh, tell me how the first year went for you? Like what uh, what you learn? What like what like what are you uh, trying to improve on? Like doesn't how whatever you want to take it. Um. Yeah. I I just I like listening to everything you're saying and realistically, just like the 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 namesake of this podcast, right? When you're chasing an edge or you're pushing yourself to do something that you've never done before, there's going to be friction. And I would, if I had to put one word on this year, it'd be a lot of friction. Uh, Just a lot of learning, a lot of growth for myself. um, A lot of reminders of, of reminders to be myself, I guess is probably a lot of that. And so tons of friction. And for the people listening who don't know anything about what I've done or or who I am, I just, uh, in the past, like, four years, I've done four different jobs within professional baseball and uh, moved across the world to Europe and reinvented my career and all these things. And so it's just like this constant emotional 
battering, you know, of like, all right, I, now I suck at this thing. Okay. I'm getting a little better at this thing. And, and, and now I suck at this new thing and now I'm going to suck at this and I'm going to be bad at this. And so having to like battle that emotion of like, you know, doubting and fear and everything is basically something that I'm like living in all the time. So that's uh, to give anyone listening a little bit of background. Um, and then more specifically, like the transition to being a head coach. And I put that in air quotes for anyone listening. Um, I would say I kind of came in and, and you know me a little bit, Brian, but um, I'm a little like intense, you know, and <laughs> I said to myself at the beginning of the year, I was like, Rachel, don't be a psycho. Like, do not be a psycho. You don't need to go full saving on these people. Like just, you know, just whatever. And I was too, I was too lax, you know? So the learning point for me this year was just be myself, which just sounds so corny, but myself is, I have super high standards. I know how to communicate them extremely clearly and I will hold you accountable. I will not forget to hold you accountable. Um, and I probably could have done more of that this year, uh, especially with, we had a super, super young group at the level that I was at, um, in the Yankees minor league system. And I could have been a little bit more strict up front, which is funny for me to say, because I'm, I'm traditionally very much like that naturally. And so I should have just been myself is the learning point there. Um, but yeah, I have 10 others if you want to hear them, but I'm sure you have other questions. Yeah, I just, well, I just think the the authenticity there, I think it's such a, cause it's really hard to do in the realm of like the beginner, like we're same as like, I've faced it with like getting into the, like the breath world coaching or presenting or even the podcast and those kind of things. You always, I, I, the expectations are different when you start thinking about the external and more like, I, I just, I feel like the authenticity is like, that's one of the purest forms of leadership. And then I've had this conversation recently, a bunch, as far as uh, like first year head coaches, mostly in football, and then a little bit with Ohio state baseball and some other, and other, other places where um, it's guys come in like either super hard or super lax in this whole spectrum. I think the cool thing about you is that you are like, you have this entire spectrum, like, nails and you can articulate it all the like all the way we've had these some of these conversations around a dinner table before where yeah like the standards non-negotiable and I don't think that probably ever left even your approach whether you were going authentically your savage self which is a special pe person but also your ability to empathize and understand while still holding the standard I think that um I think those make the best coaches like even the Mike Vrabels and the people I've been around yeah, they ha they have these rigid, hard themselves standards, but they also have the like the capability to empathize. Not everybody has that, and that's I think that's a separator from like the good to great coaches, even the marginal to good in that in that sector. So as far as um, feeling that and like pushing that forward, like was there like kind of like a spur on moment where like all right, this is over, like this is good. <laughs> well, I just like because like I know yeah. I know I know how like I would approach it identical uh to what it kind of like seems like you articulate because like I, I have a savage leader side of myself and then I have all this like help everybody like everybody rowing in the same direction and just such a a multi-variable scenario and then what what age group it was like your kind of age range on your team yeah so this is a little bit of a misnomer um again if you don't know baseball that well and you're listening so I was at um I was at low a which is basically kind of the middle of the minor league system and the guys that I was working with were age 18 to oldest 23 but mostly 18 to 20 year olds and um, for more context most of the position players that I was working directly with every single day were Latin American players who I would say 80% of those people didn't graduate high school and have trouble speaking English. So all of those variables combined, um, it's definitely a group that needs structure and hates structure right now. Um, it's, it's a little bit like dealing with probably high school freshmen. Um, so that's, that's the age group. And in my brain, in my perspective, um, I'm a high structure person and a high structure coach, but to your point, they all still call me mom. You know, so there's still that side that's there and they know that I love them, but it's painful. Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's a lot of pain and a lot of growth going on for those those kids. I call them kids because I am damn near 16 years older than most of them, I think now. But 
Um, there's a lot of emotional growth going on for them. And that's really painful. And it's painful when somebody's holding you accountable to what you say you want to do. So um, there's the strict side of me, like you said, and there's the mom side of me as well. And, and they think they know um, that I love them, although that could take another 10 years for them to figure out that out. <laughs> yeah, but that's so damn cool. I just, I think of myself when I'm 18 to 20 and I was ridiculously immature yeah I was at Northwestern ridiculously immature and I mm-hmm. I had Pat Fitzgerald who's still the head coach at Northwestern sit me down multiple times and like it, it was apparent like a father they were fatherly conversations and like despite like I didn't call him dad or anything like that but like that was undoubtedly the like like this you need it's time to be a man it's time to be true to your word it's and then the biggest thing he always hit me with is like like do you really want to leave your potential on the table and I have, I never had anybody sit me down and do that, let alone in like somebody that was older than me. And it's probably a similar age gap too, in that realm where I think that like you, like the trust, like once I had that for like, we had a couple conversations about Brian, stop going back to Ohio and all that kind of stuff. But like, but once he said, said like the potential thing, like that sunk like the hook in me, as far as like my ability to start to develop structure and leadership. So I think that like I like I don't know if you take that for granted, but I think that's so damn cool that they that they one call you that, and then two you're still able to um, create the structure that you want and hold the standard you want. Uh, the, 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 any other lessons in that kind of with that hat on that you uh, found? Um, uh, you asked if there was a breaking point, and I think it's just an interesting story to tell from a coaching perspective. But we were a couple months into the season, and it was a super uh, talented. Um, high prospect minor league team that were super young and immature and we were, we were failing a ton. I mean, we looked like the bad news bears on the field. Like it was like eight errors in a game. I mean, it was like so embarrassing, you know, and you're just sitting there as a coach in the dugout, like they got to play, you know, so you, you're kind of helpless in some moments, but the conversations off the field finally just like sat them all down. And there was guys also, you know, showing up late or, not really, not really having integrity with their word. And the thing with baseball or professional baseball, and this probably rings true in in a lot of professional sports is you don't really, you don't miss playing time. Most of the time you might get it under the table, fine behind closed doors, but you're not going to sit out. And that's a lot of times what young people need is their ass on the bench to get a message across. And so we're not able to do that. And so what did I do? I basically just set up this, um, it was a turning point. You asked me, and I basically sat everyone down. I was like, look, if it was up to me. I would give you motherfuckers plane tickets home, but mm. I can't do that. So here's how we're going to do this. And I basically was like, to those of you who are doing things right, you're going to get rewarded. To those of you who are doing things wrong, you're going to get punished. And I set up this competition, which I do. I've done multiple times. I learned it from Brian, you and I have probably talked about this, but Anson Dorrance, he's the head coach at UNC Women's Soccer. He's one of the most successful coaches of all time across any sport in the history of the world. Yeah, uh, He's still coaching actively and um, he's, you know, it's UNC women's soccer. So you think about Mia Hamm, you think about U.S. women's soccer, it's, it's here because of him. So he has something he calls the competitive cauldron. He learned it from Dean Smith at UNC basketball, also a, you know, Hall of Fame coach. So I've implemented the competitive cauldron many times in my career, and I did that this season. And it really was a turning point for me personally, but also for the team of just like, all right, there's got to be some order. The people who are doing things right need to get points and be rewarded for that visibly. And also the people who are doing things wrong need to be punished. And in a world where in professional sports, you don't always get the punishment, you're still going to play that next game because we need you to play. Um, There needed to be some kind of structure. So we did that. I separated them into teams. And off they went. And it's amazing how if you just use human psychology and especially like putting them in groups and naming a captain, how that changes people's attitudes and how they feel embarrassed when it's affecting their little group. So we, we assigned points. And if somebody was, you know, late, it was minus three points. And then all of a sudden their teammates are all over their ass for it. So that was kind of the turning point and something that I, again, say I want to go back to my, being myself was just simply adding more structure. And that was one of the ways that we tangibly added more structure to what was going on. Yeah, that's dynamite. I love the tangible side of leadership and how it shows up. And like, a, like that's not an incredibly complex structure, but how nope. freaking powerful of a lever is that? 
because and I I've I've gotten in this conversation with actually some Northwestern's strength and position coaches in that realm where um the ability to one I think it's not just human psychology because I think I'm a obviously a physiology coach but like there is a physiology of competitiveness and leadership and winning like if you continue to and like when teams or players get into these losing patterns which Northwestern had a rough year this year um there was a lack of com- competition outside uh, like off of the playing field like obviously right. practice everything competitive but everything's competitive like if I want to be the best baseball player or football player like I'm, I'm going to win my sleep I'm going to win my diet I'm going to win my habits like I'm going to recover faster than you I'm, like that's competition and physiology too but I've learned through like different human psychology and physiology now that there's literally like a winning physiology behind that it's respiratory pattern it's testosterone it's all these mm-hmm. things it's like and you can see like Jordan Peterson describes it very simply with a lobster like how they when they fight and how they like either they retreat or they grow like and now it talked about dominance and all these things breed um again success and accountability through a tangible structure because there's points and you know who's winning and losing you know and now you like now it's a hands-off deal where now you get to like you get more freedom as a coach and now your peripherals might open up just a little bit more i just i fucking love that and i think that um because I've been and I've been on NFL teams where they don't hold the superstars accountable. And it, it's the uh, same thing in college, same thing in all those realms. And it mm-hmm. depletes their uh, credibility really quick in my eyes where I just like I knew I just knew I, I, I was always on the edge of getting cut. So it was just like I knew I didn't. Get <laughs> that, I knew I didn't get that leash. And I, I mean, it took me three years to get in the NFL anyway. So I knew I didn't have the leash. But in my eyes as a coach or in a leader, like no every like it's equal like almost like equal opportunity like in that essence where like everybody should have the same leash everybody should be functioning on the same rules and obviously the nfl has all these uh kind of town and gown relationships that are trash where the gm and the head coach don't see eye to eye because of some of those undercuttings obviously they get control of personnel and it sounds like you ran into that a little bit too but um i like if you're gonna i think the development of the players like in like any system at any level is paramount. That's why I I love talking to strength coaches. And obviously you've been a strength coach for a decade on top of the position you're holding now, but in that realm, like the development people, like I like their mindset because they get so much more like touch time with the players and Mm -hmm. you, and you see the people like the successful people I've talked to that they have this same tangible structure where they always know who's winning and losing and because they have this built-in competition. So I'm just, I'm hyping up your system. Um, and then I, like, I know a bunch of products from UNC soccer too, and they're all savages because it becomes part of their DNA. And then now it's just like time. Now, now that you have the structure and the standard and you, and again, you've like, what, however you found it, you found it. And now it's like, okay, let's fucking ride. I'm I, so I'm excited for you, but uh, it, it's also cool to hear um because I, I just the the transition into this new role and then like absorbing the feedback and then getting to this system that's you and authentic, I think is fucking juicy. So, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Uh, you touched on some pretty important things about like when you're one of the most agonizing feelings. And I, I earlier I mentioned that being a manager, you know, being a head coach is is in air quotes for anyone listening that didn't just see me put air quotes on that. Because technically, like as a manager in professional baseball, you're not the head coach. The general manager is the head coach, you know, and <clears throat> that's probably se- semi true also in any professional sport, basically, because the general manager is controlling, you know, what players you get. They're going to be involved in day-, day near every single decision that that any head coach is making, no matter what sport it is. So that's why I want to be a general manager segue, you know, yeah. but, but the whole point of saying that is it's, it's agonizing when as a coach, you know, especially someone like yourself who has earned every ounce of NFL time that you ever had, you know, oh, stop, stop. stop, stop, stop. But like, but, but for me as well, you know, I, I was definitely that type of like athlete back in the day. And then now in my career. I have scratched and clawed my way through my career to earn every little thing that I've gotten because I, I'm going to steal that. Like I've, I'm always on the edge of being cut, you know, like I don't belong here, you know? So everything I do has to be like 10 times as good as everybody else to get that same level of respect. If I can ever get it. Sorry, my dogs. I know. Oh, I love, no, I love it. I, I like yeah. more, I like more life on the podcast. Yeah. 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 
So if anybody was wondering what's writhing around in the background, yeah. that's my dog. Um, so anyway, it's like, you know, when you're, when you're that type of person, it's agonizing when you're in a position of leadership and you know how to hold a standard, but you're not able to. So like you just said, like the superstars could do whatever, sometimes literally whatever the fuck they want, it seems like, and still going to play on the weekend. And for us, it's the same thing. And so how is a head coach or manager in that situation, how do I then create an artificial system where those people are getting shit, you know, they are getting yeah. their punishment. And that, that played out for us where, for example, I set up the teams and I, you know, I put the people that needed to be together together. Right. And so there was this one guy who was, for example, he was a leader by example. And I also put that in air quotes, cause I actually think that's kind of bullshit. He's a leader by example. He did everything right, but he would never say anything to anybody else, right? So he was the example. But when you've got a bunch of immature dudes, they're not going to follow an example. They need someone to be in their ass. <laughs> Otherwise, they're not going to change. So I would have multiple talks with this kid. And I'm like, hey, you got to open your mouth. Like, you don't like what's going on in the clubhouse. Like, they can't always be the coaches saying stuff. It's got to be from peers. And he's like, oh, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not really that guy. Blah, blah, blah. So immediately when I put these guys in groups we assigned points to things and of course there was a prize and it was a good prize it was basically like a $500 value prize which to minor league baseball players is a lot of money yeah so I put them in teams and what do you know the next day this non-vocal leader is like yelling at his teammates like get, get your ass over here you're gonna be late like screaming you know so immediately it shifted behavior and it gave me, like you said, it, it freed me up. I wasn't the one yelling anymore. It was, it was them yelling at each other, you know, good and bad. And so it really freed me up and let me sit back, but it also provided that accountability that I was not able to give, you know, from, by taking away playing time and giving somebody else the playing time that has earned it or worked harder for it. So though all those things are, you know, it didn't, it doesn't hundred percent solve your problems, but it definitely made a huge impact. Um, and that is, like you said, it's not complicated and I'm sure, like you said too, people do this all the time and, and practice is competitive, but as soon as you like separate, you know how you've been through yeah. million practices like this, <laughs> Once you separate you teams, you give the points there's a little money on the line, everything changes. It's like the intensity just jumps up a whole nother level. So I'm sure this is not rocket science to most coaches or people listening out there, but what I do is just put it probably into more structure and do it more of the time and not just like a one-off someday that's really fun and everyone gets all hyped up and then you don't do it again. Yeah. You like you give a competitor a scoreboard, they're going to compete. And like, it, it doesn't have to be anything past that. Like, I, it, I mean, there's obviously like all the elements, but like in the same realm where like, I think a separator from a great leader is like, okay, yeah, of course they're like the bare necessity is lead by example and do your job obviously. But now like the, what makes great leaders is the ability to be vocal and articulate it besides that. Like I'm talking from like a player standpoint, I think it's the same thing where the hard thing as like a leader, as a player, something particularly, I was a weird person where I was like, I was also on the edge of being cut, but I also was also a leader on the team. So, which it was a weird dynamic. Same. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but you know, the deal where it's just um, the insecurity that like, so for me to be like getting paid less and, do, and trying to like, like tear that, like tear up somebody that's making $10 million yeah. or making $3 million on special teams or whatever it ends up being like, there's that kind of friction to where the, the structure that it sounds like you put in place freed up that ability for me to, if I was a player to say, okay, like, no, we, we, I know you're losing, you're costing us points. And I like, I wish I had a structure like that when I was playing because I was having all these internal battles to, okay, like do your job, like grab guys on the side, tell them, Hey, we need to work on this to get this better. But no, once I, once I was able to uh, negotiate with my brain enough to be like, okay, like just be your fucking self and yell at this guy in the team meeting room. <laughs> and, like, what they, but like, that's where like, that's, and then I, like, I got separated as a leader at that point. And then now that elevated my own standard for myself. Cause I can't make like the foolish mistakes. I can't not be prepared. I can't know everything backwards and forwards. And it just, it again rising tide lifts all ships and ships in that realm and if the structure is the rising tide now like it's like let's who who knows where we go but like i think the 
the the vulnerability to be vocal as a leader is, is tough. Like obviously you're in a position to do so as the manager and like you have the microphone a, a decent amount of time, but when the players start taking the mic from you and singing their own karaoke for a terrible analogy, um, I think it's really cool. And I like, I'm pumped that that played out and you, it just, I, I'm, I'm just excited to see where it goes for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you, we, I don't want to, I do not want to s- skip over your, uh, mindset as the the journey to where you're at now because I think that's absolutely electric too. Um, because you did you scratched and clawed for everything and I'll and for, I'll forever respect the living fuck out of you for that because, uh, well just like you you faced obstacles that one you probably couldn't an- anticipated and then you constantly pushed the uh basically pushed the rock up the hill in the realm of like and the rock got bigger and bigger whether it was going to the Netherlands to get your masters or whatever so uh. As far as your mind, and then now we get into the weight room. There's a lot of things I want to talk to you about. But uh, <laughs> at, so as you got into the industry, which initially was as a uh, assistant strength coach, correct? Mm-hmm. With the Cardinals. And then so like from there, we'll start there as far as like getting like getting in there um, and then moving up through the ranks. Like what was your mindset? What was your purpose? Like how are you how are you driving the the, the car forward? Um, I want to back up just one step to get, get LSU. It. Let's not skip LSU though. Yeah, yeah. Because sorry, yeah, go I for know it. That maybe a little sensitive for you, but no, yeah. Like I, I started my career really started at LSU. I had done a couple of other internships and stuff, but um, my career in high level competitive team sports started at LSU as a graduate assistant strength coach, and that was really critical because. You know, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a psycho as is. I didn't need LSU to make me a psycho. But what, what LSU did for me was show me what a well-oiled machine looked like from a cultural standpoint at the team level, at a high level of sports like that. And when I was there, it was like everyone was winning. It was like football was in the national championship, baseball, softball, in the college world series, women's basketball and sweet six. Every team that I was with was these like high level championship cultures. And so I was working with six different teams. and every practice I went to, it was like cutthroat, 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 cutthroat. It was like every, every little bubble that I was a part of was just so intense. Um, And it was really the remnants. Saban had left maybe three years before I got there. And so it was like the remnants of like all of the staff and processes that he had put in place there were still going. Um, So I really got my coaching, like I cut my coaching teeth there, which was really important for me. And then from there, I was hired to the St. Louis Cardinals as an intern. Do you want me to tell this whole thing? It's really yeah. long. I'll try to go fast. I'm going to go fast. Yeah, did, uh, yeah do your thing. We, 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 I, I love the sagas, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just like I'm going to go fast because it's too long. But basically, I got the opportunity of a lifetime. Truly, I got to go and be an intern for three months for the St. Louis Cardinals, which at the time, I don't think there was – I'm almost certain there were, had never been any strength coaches even as an intern. And then um, after that, long story short, I was out of baseball for a year at the time to give people context because now it seems crazy because there's so many women like everywhere. But at the time it was like, people were just flat out telling me like, yeah, sorry, we, we don't hire women uh, for these positions. Like good luck, some, you know, with fucking, yeah. good luck, good luck with, with, you, softball, with you know, your whatever. life, yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. they like, I mean, they were so, it was so commonplace. The discrimination was so normal that they just were like, oh yes, we don't hire women for these positions. Sorry. It was so blatant, which nowadays you would never like, that would never happen yeah. out loud. That was just saying it behind your back, but like, they would never just tell you that right now. So anyway, that was the times. So I saw a year out of baseball after I had completed my internship and then I like literally just waitressed and worked at Lululemon and did a unpaid internship at Arizona State with baseball and softball. And then the Cardinals ended up hiring me full time as a strength and conditioning coach in 2014. They actually hired me as their minor league strength and conditioning coordinator. So I was overseeing 10 strength coaches and like 200 athletes and traveling all over the country working with them. And then after those two years, I then was with the Astros for three seasons. I was a Latin American strength and conditioning coordinator which again, for anyone out there listening that has no idea what I'm saying, that means that I was going and overseeing our Dominican affiliate. So every major league baseball team has one or two teams functioning fully in the Dominican Republic right now. So I was overseeing our Latin American operations and our lower half of our minor league system as a strength coach. And then at age of 30, I thought, you know, now's a good time to restart my entire life and move to Europe 
and cut down my life's possessions to three suitcases and sell everything I have, including my car. Let's so go. at age 30, I decided that I wanted to get out of strength and conditioning and I wanted to get on the path to being a general manager. And so I moved to Europe and I got a master's, a second master's degree in uh, what I would call like biomechanics and neuroscience related to eyeballs and how hitters see a ball and how that processes in their brain. So I did a year of studying in Amsterdam, came back, did uh, my research at driveline baseball and eye tracking for hitters. And then I was hired by the Yankees as a minor league hitting coach out of driveline from Seattle, moved to Tampa, started with the Yankees and the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> Here we that. are. That was a good summary. That was a fast summary. That was um, really fast. Yeah. And then I don't want to selfishly get to the, the eyeballs yet, but um, <laughs> I, uh, well, so like, like I've started to get into like the eye tracking as far as like resets for concussions and things like that, ways to obviously like improve uh, the TBI injuries. And I work with some military guys now too, to help them. And it's been cool to see some of the progress that they've made getting in with professionals, eye tracking stuff. Um, what are some like uh, baseline nuggets that people would probably not know about like the eye tracking neuroscience world that, cause I like, I just learning that like 40% of our brains built to like process vision and all that has been flooring to me the last couple of months. Um, big rocks, the big rocks, like in interesting facts, just things yeah. to think about is that I would say I'm going to go as high as like 80% of the time when a, a professional baseball player makes contact with a baseball, they're not actually watching that happen. So they've predicted where the ball is going to be. So they might stop tracking it. The, the longer they track it, the better. And sometimes they'll actually like track it to contact, but that doesn't happen often. So it's usually like they'll stop tracking maybe five to 10 feet away from the plate. And they've just predicted where the ball is going to be as it's crossing the plate. So the old adage of like, keep your eye on the ball is not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I hate to tell all you parents out there with five-year-olds, it's not a thing. Yeah, well, um, I just, well, one of the funny, because, like, some guys, like, sometimes when I get into the mental skills world with guys, I have to, like, demystify the entire planet to them in order for them to, like, let go of their <laughs> pursuit of perfection. And, yeah. and, and, and I basically tell them that you're, like, what you're seeing isn't even real time. Like, there's still, like, 0.2 second delay on your vision to processing. And then 99% of what we take in is, like, pre-consciousness anyway. So, like, just to, like, hit that point home. I always tell guys like you're not even seeing everything in real time, let alone yeah. one of the hardest things to do on the planet is hit like a major league baseball pitch. So it's just, I just think that's a, a interesting, I think our brains are crazy, but I think one of the interesting nuances that 80% of the time, like the highest level of athlete is not even seeing the contact is flooring to me. Yeah. 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 So I mean, and the general purpose, like you just hit on is that actually we do this all the time in life, right? Like the simple example is, when you're, you know, when you're driving your car and you're making a left turn, you're waiting for that car to come on the other side, right? Like you don't like watch the car go by and then do the turn. Like you're predicting that a car is moving at a certain speed and you're predicting how fast it's coming and you're predicting so you can make the turn. We do it all the time, every single day. So it's like the brain is processing timing, distance of objects, people, surfing comes to mind for some reason like they're they're looking out they're seeing the waves come in and so they're predicting when they need to turn around and paddle it's like it's happening all the time but baseball is probably one of the most like acute examples of that and it's just um a really fascinating piece of just the brain is in my opinion um, yeah. and then i think you'll really like this one maybe one more nugget this is just for me staring at people's eyeballs. I don't even, I don't think this has been researched or published, but this is from me personally staring at people's eyeballs for like six months straight, creepily. And basically the better hitters blink less prior to the pitch. Hmm. And so as you know, or maybe you don't know, but like when you, when you're talking to someone and they're like, yeah, and you're like, do you need some weed? Like you need yeah. to fucking calm down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You are like just like a really high anxiety, like like twitchy yep. person. Yep. That all makes sense, right? So then their pupils are less reactive. They're they have a super high anxiety level. And if you have a super high anxiety level, that does not pair well with hitting a baseball and being able to predict when it's going to cross the plate, you know, at 95 plus miles an hour. So the blinking factor, interestingly, for me, just this was anecdotal from, from my own um, observation was that hitters who were blinking more 
uh, had less success. And to me, that's a direct correlation to what you and I vibe on and have, have talked about for a long time is breath work, being able to control your emotional state through your physiology, all of those things. And so I, I haven't personally done anything with that. It's just something that I thought I would share because I, I know you'll think that's. Oh pretty, yeah. Uh, I freak it. I freaking love it because so like my, how my message has probably changed since I've seen you last is like I teach physiology as a language, a language a lot of people don't speak anymore. And so in that realm, I'm reteaching the language so that they can, again, speak the language back to their brain. And obviously, like everybody kind of realizes all these things happen, obviously, like nose, mouth, like your vision, acute, like dilated versus not like all these things. But like, it's literally the speed, the sound, all these things are a language to your brain. But like I've noticed and I've, I've read some things on the blinking, but it was more related to uh, maybe panic disorders. I can't remember what it was, um, yeah. but but in that in that realm, like that's another language, particularly in a, a sport that is like paramount on the ability to focus and uh, again, track anything. How, how are you guys using the eye tracking in baseball right now as far as like prepping a guy for a game? Are you guys do you guys have different protocols for that or is it still kind of creeping its way in like it is football and stuff? <laughs> Um, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. So okay. I can't, right. I can't really I like share it. trade secrets, but I, what I will tell you just broadly is, um, and it's probably not that big of a secret. Like there's a reason why the Yankees hired me because I did that research. And so it's definitely just something that we subscribe to heavily and think is very important, which makes sense. It's not, I don't, sometimes I'm like, duh, like this isn't a secret. So I don't have to worry about sharing it. The eyes are important. The brain is important. Um, how we apply those things and the actual like techniques that we use to train it is something that I think is proprietary. But but other than that, I would just say that we we put a heavy focus on a player's ability to recognize a ball that's coming at them. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I I, I just, just in I case see... any Red Sox coaches are listening. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. No, yeah. No. I uh, no. I, I do got some baseball strength coaches that tune in, but. Uh, yeah, with, with football, it's been cool to see Cincinnati's been doing a bunch of awesome research on the decrease in concussions. And like, this isn't as acute because yep. it's because receivers will be tracking the ball. But if you like if the you've been hit a certain amount of times or a certain way and you can't see that realm, you won't wow. know that hit hits really coming. And they actually had a year where supposedly they had no concussions on their football team, which I don't know. But like their numbers have decreased as they increased the um, the eye tracking performance, both as part of like their general training and recovery, but also like pregame stuff. So I just think it's really cool that I think we just, we lose fact of like, again, we can't see our brain. So we don't really know what's going on up there. And then we've got so lost in this, like get your glutes going, do X, Y, and Z, like get your body <laughs> needs to be this hot to go. But really like, I think people overlook the breath and like understanding like that controls our state. Obviously it affects our vision, uh, affects our heart rate, all these things that do apply into like a level of performance where guys just want more control in the chaos of competition and the breath gives them that really fast. And then if you can, again, train your human as a whole, like eyes are incredibly important. And the more I learn about the brain, it's just like, damn, vision, vision's way more important than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And then even with some pilots and stuff, it's been cool to get their gauge on how they train stuff. So, but anyway, so that's oh, the point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, dude, they're incredible. And, but then they have to train their breathing in a whole different manner because of the G forces they face. And, but so just like all ever, like, again, I'm it's like, I always feel like a beginner, like in, in mild times fraudulent in the breath world. And I, <laughs> I talk to Mackenzie and I talk and I keep reading every book I can get my hands on, but it's just, there's always a new environment, a new athlete that I'm going to have to coach and learn and be new at. And it's just like, I, it literally excites me and fulfills me when I can actually help. And so anyways, besides the point, I just, the eye tracking thing has been interesting for me, but, uh, that was selfish. It's super selfish, but, um, back, uh, back to your story, as far as like driving through, um, some of the adversity you faced, um, what, like, I guess in essence, like what was the like underlying purpose? Like when you did, uh, come into this, um, I don't know, I, I mean, sexist, whatever we want to phrase it, but like the, the, the gender issues, like what, uh, kept you pushing through it and like not go back to strength coach or whatever. So I'm rereading, I'm rereading the book grit by Angela Duckworth and, um, oh, 
Yeah, you, you, oh, sorry, I, I got hyped. You know people, it. You know people, it, right? Well, well, you well, you put me on the you you put me on the book. Uh, you put me on the yeah, book okay. like yeah. six or six years ago now. Some some crazy. Yeah. Um. And but in that yeah. but in that realm, like I was gonna pull grit into the conversation because of the like the waitressing, the Lula, like all that kind of stuff. And I like I was a fucking nanny, and I was doing demolition and do like so. I <laughs> I, I, I fucking vibe with you on that part of the story because um. Sorry. Shelby's, I didn't. So he's making yeah, here. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't respect that part of my journey until I read that book and you told me about it. So like, I'm yeah, grateful. yeah. Yep. I do think I remember talking to you and you're like, oh yeah, like I did this and this and this and it wasn't that big a deal. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. It is a big deal. Yeah. So anyway, grit. I'm rereading it right now. And one of the key things that she says about people being gritty is that not only. You don't, it's not just about when you're interested in something, you give up your entire life to go do it. It's, it's being interested, but it's also having a purpose attached to it. And so when there is a purpose attached to something that is for the greater good of the world or your community or whoever you're, you're near, she's this, right, let me just get, this. no, I, lo I love it. There, there we go. Anyway, when you have a purpose attached to your interest, that's when you can really maximize the level of like grit that you're putting out. So you could be interested in, I don't know, golfing. People are interested in that and they want to do it a lot and that's cool. But like, there's no perp, there's no driving purpose behind that. So they don't give up their entire career and go follow it. But like for me at early, early on, I wanted to coach, but then when I was getting discriminated against and I was being blatantly told that I couldn't do it, you know, I was yeah. like, oh, you think that I can't yeah. do it? That's cute. Daiquiri, let's go, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's so cute of you. Yeah. I'll see you next year, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. So I think that early, early, like this is back in the 2012, whatever, when I had already had this resume and also I had already been at LSU working with baseball and softball and and I'd already like done a bunch of stuff. My resume was great. And, you know, they were just saying, hey, we can't hire women. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Like, I'm not going anywhere, you know? Yeah. So that was like the beginning. Um, but at the same time, like twofold, professional baseball to me has always been fascinating because of it's just, it's ultra unique in the space of professional sports because that, because we signed Latin American players at age 16. And then they go through this like six year minor league journey before they get on TV. Whereas like, you know, NFL, NBA, it's a lot more cut and dry. You know, it's just like, you know, usually outside of your story, yeah. usually you get signed, you go play for the team. You know, like that's usually how it goes. Whereas minor league baseball, it's this wildly fascinating business. And it's this wildly fascinating journey that all of these guys go on all of them, even the superstars, like they, the fast track is three years in the minor leagues, you know, that's super fast, but it's usually more like five to seven years, depending on where you were signed. So it's like this whole journey that these guys go through has always been so fascinating to me. And ever since I got into the game, my purpose was to make the game better. And, and I often now, nowadays, I'm like the least of my contributions to this game will be because of my gender. Like everyone thinks that's like the big thing, but it's like, no, I'm going to literally change the fucking sport. Like you guys don't even know what I'm going to be able to do, you know, when I'm in other leadership positions. So it's really just been to improve the journeys for these players because it is so arduous and so difficult. So it's really just to make an impact on the, the game of professional baseball. And that those two pieces of purpose have driven me pretty well for the past decade. Um, I would say the whole like woman thing, you know, the whole chip on my shoulder is is truthfully fa fading the past like couple of years because it's done. You know, it's it's not done. Somebody somebody out there would get mad at me for saying that. Some feminists would be like, "We yeah. have so much more." But for me, it's like, God, women have so much opportunity in professional sports in general now, football as well. You know that. I'm like, okay, like it's done. I'm free. Like I'm set free from that, you know, that, that rock that I was pushing up the mountain, like it's there, you know, and, or, or there's 10 other women to push it up for me. Like I don't have to do that anymore. But now it's really zoning in on like, how can we really shift professional baseball? And frankly, like we've fallen behind other sports as far as like fan base. So how can we get professional baseball back on track to being America's favorite pastime, because as much as I hate to say this, and you love to hear this, 
football is now America's favorite pastime. And so like, what, what can we do? How can we make this better? Not only for, you know, the player experience, but the fan experience. And that's something that I, I find a lot of purpose in. Yeah, that's, there's so good God. There's so much there to unpack. Uh, one, your self-awareness is dynamite in that realm. Cause like, like I, like I, I didn't want to try and make anything about like the, the woman process of this, but like, even if it was like 5% of your fire or 10 or 20, whatever percent of it was, the self-awareness to know that like it, like I call it the Icarus paradox where it's like what got you there is not going to keep you there. And you obviously keep this student mindset. So I think it's dynamite in that realm where it's like, yeah, like the, the, just to be like, the purpose is to better the fucking sport. And like, what a, what a purpose in, in and of itself. I, I think some of like the best humans have that a, a similar relatable purpose to the game or wh whether it is the players intentionally or the sport as a whole, they're, they 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 want to have their impact on like again making it more available to the the player itself and then the human that's consuming the sport and being entertained by it so i think that's really cool and then um the 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 development of players i, I don't think people understand because i don't, i've just learned about that more in the last couple of years or i've heard my my uncle tell me the stories of like some of the latin american players coming and like the hardships they have to keep them on track and i didn't even realize it was like three years at the fastest like six years is a long time to like I we hide in college but it's like the structure is way more yeah. clean so I think and like that's why I've always whenever I've talked to baseball coaches and even strength coaches in the baseball industry and stuff like it as say I was a GM or some crazy thing if I just like objectively look at the structure from the top down the development of that one to seven years of that player in the minor leagues, that's going to be the superstar in the future needs to be absolutely paramount. So I think it's really cool that you're again in charge of that torch and sharing the information because you've been on the strength side, you've been in the school education side, you've been, and like people don't understand how like drive lines, like the cathedral baseball, like development where they're, they're at the forefront of everything. And now you bring this whole concept and on top of like you're, fucking savage structure i think it's really cool position that you've earned but it's cool cool to hear the roots of it in the realm of these multiple purposes and then now you have the ability to self-evaluate and shed that like do you have like an intentional practice of doing that in the realm of like okay like what do you constantly revisit your purpose or do you like refine it or how like how do you approach that if you do it all yeah, I think that more than most people I'm just okay with like letting things go, you know, and so I don't have to be the same I don't have to have the same purpose that I did last year and it, I'm not a I'm not a fickle person it's just I need to recognize that what served me like you said it's like what got me here isn't going to get me where I'm going and what served me last year who served me last year I'm I'm great at letting friends go mm. <laughs> sounds so ruthless I'm great at letting boyfriends go like yeah I am the best you know if, if I let somebody go they're just poof gone and, and the reason is, is because it's not vindictive or angry. It's just like, okay, like I've changed as a person, as a human, I've, I've evolved. And this person really helped me and showed me some things and it was phenomenal. And then like, and now it's over. It's like, I, I look at friends and people and, and things and, and mindsets like books, right? Like remember when you read that great book 10 years ago and you were like, this is the best book ever. It changed my life. And then you read it again and you're like, oh. Why did I even like that in the first yeah, place? Yeah, you know? I know. But at the time it was really paramount to your development. But now like the book goes to the goodwill and it's okay. And somebody else is going to pick up that book. So I just view things in general, you know, people, places, things, mindsets, emotions, ideas, like books, like, okay, it's, it's fine. I'm constantly shedding my skin. I'm constantly reevaluating if things are serving me or not. Um, I know that I won't be in baseball forever. I'm totally okay with that. There's going to be no qualms about leaving it. Like, I, I feel like I shed identities much easier than, than most people, probably just because of the perspective that I take on it. Yeah, that's, that's electric because I, I've had this conversation on the podcast a bunch because identity comes up as far as like, it's been more with the athletes transitioning out of sport yeah. and things like that. But um, Caroline Burkle articulated really well that like, and like, if you really want like a balanced life or like a self-aware understanding of life, like life's just a bunch of little let goes. And when we get into trouble is when we build up this crazy identity 
and like never let go of it. And eventually we do have to, because the world forces us like unintentional yeah. growth versus intentional growth concept where eventually I have to drop it off where like, really like everything has a time, a season, a chapter. And then now we can, again, like it just keeps you in that shedding. I like the shedding your skin concept uh, makes it so much easier to just have a little let goes. And, but you're just because you're letting go of something doesn't mean it's still not part of your armor. That's carrying you forward into battle. So I, I, I really like that perspective. So that's a, uh, yeah, that's dynamite as a, excuse me. Uh, there should, there was something else in our, our rant about uh, the development of players and that kind of thing. Uh, whatever. Uh, we'll come back to it. But as far as uh, uh, we, cause we touched on um, the, I want to talk about the Spanish thing. There it is. Um, so did, so did you know Spanish before you got into that role or was that like another tool you picked up out of necessity? I'm from Nebraska, Brian, you know, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I had no Spanish. I, you know, I did the Spanish in high school and barely paid attention. Cause I was like, when am I going to use this? Yeah. And, you know, then seven years later, I was working with mostly Latin American speaking young, you know, baseball players and. Um, that was another thing, like just first day I had rolled straight out of LSU's weight room into St. Louis Cardinals. And it was like culture shock times a million because I was, you know, high level college sports is like the military. It's like every, just everything's so, especially when you're with a good program, like it's so structured, everyone's so on time and doing everything right. And then I went to like pro ball and I walk in first day and I'm like super fired up to be there. And we started the stretch and like, I'm speaking English, of course, and no one's listening to me and no one's doing what I want them to do. And I was like, oh shit, like what is about, what is happening? So to their surprise and to their, you know, sadness, the next day I had just written down everything in Spanish. And I was like awkwardly stumbling through stretch with my little paper, you know, doing Spanish. But that kicked off into like, I basically... I basically just said, you know, if I'm going to be good at my job and good at communicating, which is something that we talk about all the time, right? Coaches and communication. And it's brought up all the time in baseball, right? Everyone's like, well, I'm going to take Brett Bartholomew's conscious coaching communication course, which is great. By the way, I'm not making yeah. fun of Brett. It's more so just like, great. You're taking a communication co course, but you can't even fucking speak Spanish. Like, what are we talking about? You literally can't speak the language that your players speak. So it's really just a literal, like it was for me to take a literal step forward in being able to communicate effectively with the players. Um, and at the time it was also critical because I was the only woman in like a hundred miles. Like there was a no, thousand miles. Like I think there were two on field women at the time. Like when I first got into baseball, maybe, maybe I could be wrong on this in all of men's professional sports. Mm. So like, it was really weird that I was there looking back at the time. I didn't think it was weird, but I look back and I'm like, Oh my God, those players, like they were so good with me and it was so strange for them. So anyway, all that to say was critical. It was a critical connecting point because I was one of the few coaches that was really making a, a concerted like obvious effort to learn Spanish. And so immediately that made the connection and the relationship better with Spanish players, Spanish speaking players. And so immediately they were like, oh, somebody who cares about me and actually wants to come to me and learn my language and help me feel more comfortable and help me be able to understand what she's saying instead of just, you know, yelling at me in English and telling me to figure it out. So really that was like, I quickly just dove head first into learning Spanish. And now I would say I'm I don't know, like 80% fluent somewhere yeah. around there. I still don't think I'm fluent, but I can, I can hold my own in pretty much any conversation, but it's, it continued to serve me with the Latin American players um, year after year. It, it always comes in handy. It's always something that um, helps me develop relationships, obviously, you know, yeah. again, it's like everyone talks about communication, but I know plenty of people in baseball that just have been in it for 15 years and don't know any Spanish. You're like, bro, drop the communication course. Like maybe just yeah. learn Duolingo that, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's that. So what do you, do you, uh, it's probably hard to gauge, but as far as like the coaches and the minor leagues, uh, even like up through the MLB and everything, uh, how many do you think actually can hold a conversation in Spanish? Of like American born English yeah. speaking, English speaking coaches. I'm going to say probably 20 to 30% have really like made the effort to become like fluent enough to 
hold their own in conversations. Um, I'm not just trying to like rag on these people. It's more so I, I don't, I think it also takes a certain level of like, you basically have to sound like an idiot for a couple of years, which is hard. Like that's why most people don't learn languages very well is because they're afraid to speak and be embarrassed. And I definitely have a high threshold for like not giving a fuck. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, just being embarrassed and like having them laugh at me. And once you realize that they, the more that you show vulnerability in front of them and struggle learning a language, the same thing that they're trying to do, by the way, because they're in the United States of America trying to learn English, you know, so they'll laugh at you, but then they're also really appreciating that you're vulnerable and that you're showing that side that you're, you're letting them teach you. It's a great point of like, okay, I'm not just your coach. You're, you're helping me. And there's that, there's that collective vulnerability going on of like a shared experience. So especially when I was first getting in, it's like, how could, how could this white woman from Nebraska possibly relate to these young 18 year old Latin American players with Dominican Republic? How could this possibly work? It's like, we're both kind of doing the same thing, you know? So there's all those points of connection. Yeah. And I think that's like, it makes lot like, again, like just as an outsider looking in, it makes, makes logical sense to pursue that. But I think one of the biggest, like one of the most awesome things about really good leaders are, is like the ability to look like a beginner and not like stand up there and grandstand like you have all the answers because it's everybody's winging it. I don't care. Like I've talked to like massive head coaches and in, in sports and like they're still winging it to some extent. So to get up there and like or even on a one to one level, be vulnerable and do that. And how I start to tangibilize it in the mental skill world where uh you said uh a tolerance of looking stupid or or something like that i i call it like i call it a feedback tolerance and like we everybody craves like and i had logan gelbrick on who you know uh, as well um he talks about everybody wants to be led and he he hates it he, he, like an un, unpopular opinion but everything goes better when somebody's up there saying how it is as opposed to like the human who doesn't deal, deal well psychologically with uncertainty that they everything gets weird and everybody like overreacts or like doesn't know where to go. So you waste energy and trying to get in the same direction. So that's why leadership yeah. one is, is magnificent. But it's also like if once you start understanding that vulnerability, that the connection that gets seared, I just feel like the Spanish side of that world, again, just back to that overlooking those look like as a coach, like if I if my ability to coach you is 75% limited by language, like I need to bridge that gap. And I haven't read the, con I bought the conscious coaching book. I haven't read it yet, but uh, in that realm, it, it makes more logical sense to be able to communicate. Like there needs to be the ability to communicate first. Yeah. And that, and that, because there's all, I mean, you can look just to play devil's advocate here. Like Logan does another good thing with his coaches out at Deuce gym where in his coaches prep, he has like, he'll have like, he'll you get, okay, go coach this person on snatch, whatever. And and then at some point in the coaching session, he goes, all right, you can't use your words anymore. You can only use your body language. And so he starts to understand people's strengths and weaknesses and how you can truly communicate. But obviously like a language barrier like that only makes logical sense to where if I'm a GM, uh, I would eventually have a system and structure built to where yeah. everybody required. required. And like, again, it's just in, in, a, in the level of efficiency and then track it, like give people scores on their Spanish. You know, or like give people scores on their ability. I to, would like, say if look... you're not a certain level of Spanish proficiency after one year of working here, you're fired. It's pretty yeah. simple. Yeah, heavy structure. <laughs> but like, but... this is not a standard. This Anyone who, who's in baseball listening to this, which I don't know how many people will, but it makes me sound like a psycho. But it's like, because it's not, that's not the current standard. It, it's kind of like, oh, well, some people magically can learn Spanish and other people don't. Yeah, um, and it doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, like we just discussed, it's so important. And as much as we damn near every organization probably says like one of our pillars is communication, you know, like yeah. everyone says that we, we want to be good at communicating. Yeah. Well, damn, if you got 50 percent of your players that don't speak English, we better have some kind of system in place to get the coaches up to speed. And you could also easily say, well, why don't the players learn English? But you know, this isn't always the case, but the majority of cases are we're dealing with our Latin American players are coming from, you know, developing countries with lower levels of education, which makes it really difficult for them to retain information, to use critical thinking, to put pieces together. And it takes them longer to learn some things sometimes. Doesn't mean that they're not talented baseball players. So don't. Yeah, sounds like I, I'm thinking as an outsider that, again, doesn't know all the nuances of baseball. That sounds logical. <laughs> 
Right. So like, yeah. I'm not trying to, it's like, doesn't mean that they're not talented. doesn't mean that they don't have incredible vision and brain processing that they can't make contact with the baseball. Yeah. But sometimes learning and, and information retention is difficult. I grew up in a really well-educated country and I have a high level of education beyond way beyond high school and I'm able to learn faster. So it's my job as the leader, the coach, the role model to learn as fast as I can, learn Spanish as fast as I can to be able to help these players. And so it's, it's not, it shouldn't be just on them. However, the requirements should be for both. Latin American players have to learn English and we have certain standards for them. And also coaches have to learn Spanish and we have certain standards for them to meet. And to your point, like, if you haven't put in the effort to learn that, then you're fired. Yeah. And <laughs> it's I, that simple. Fair. Like, and I don't know, I like, I'm really good at learning out of necessity. So if there's a hard consequence on me not learning Spanish, y'all are. I'll figure it the fuck out. Yeah. And I, I, I think every human similar to like, which, which to your point, uh, and then, uh, one, we're already ripping at an hour. So, uh, I'll start to wind it down a little bit, but, yeah. um, uh, I like I'm always been a believer that like the weight room is the best teacher on the planet. And I know you're a believer in that as well. And you've carried that with you even outside of your coaching days in the weight room. Um, how do you use that to uh, balance yourself out currently? Oh man, the weight room is like the weight room is my meditation. Mm -hmm. Always anything physical is my meditation. It's just like, it used to be my job and I'm almost glad, I'm glad I'm not a strength coach for many reasons now that I've moved on in my career. But like one of the things is like, now it truly is like a true source of enjoyment. I don't, I almost try not to think about like the, the sets and the reps and the technical side of it. It's just like this pure joy meditation, whether it's working in the yard with shovels and a pickaxe or whatever, or it's going to the gym and, and lifting with a barbell. Um, it's just like, the purest form of I let everything else go and I'm just like using my body to get things done and within those moments is when I have some of my best thoughts for the day usually hell yeah and I, I love the get out of your head and get into your body concept where I think the weight room does that for me as well so I just uh I know you've been a proponent of that and then as also in that in that category of like the because like obviously like being loving training like translates to oh it makes a logical sense to be a strength coach or maybe and it served you at some point or whatever it, it, it was a stepping stone whatever it end up being for you I always thought it was interesting uh for me because like at one point uh, uh, just a cold little nuance how you've uh influenced my my <laughs> oh, career God. choices as well no it's been, it was really cool we were having a conversation and like I just finished up football and I was I had some job offers from some other companies that I don't want to throw the boys under the bus at all but uh one job made sense because I know I'd be good at it but it also like you basically said like do you really like do you really want to sell metal and like you simplified it <laughs> and 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 like and I and I loved it but it just like that little nuance like yeah you love training yeah you can go lift and do all these things with every coach on the planet in the strength world but like is there feedback and fulfillment there? And there wasn't, and it di didn't make logical sense for me at the time, but um, I always use the weight room and I like, I'll never neglect the weight room in that essence, because again, I just think that fulfills the mind and the realm of whether it is peace and meditation or this understanding and capability of what strength is. Like, I don't think like a certain level of strength is never a weakness. So I always start pushing, I always keep that rock at least stopped on the hill. If I ever start to fall down, I'll go back up for, until I drop kind of deal. But in that realm, I, I think you're going to say that. I knew you were going to yeah. bring that up about <laughs> it's yeah, like, well, there's a famous line from, uh, I think Steve Jobs said it when he was hiring the Apple CEO, which I'm forgetting his name, but he basically was just like, this guy was working for Pepsi at the time. And he was like, look, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or you want to come with me and change the world? Like, yeah. what are we doing here? You know? And I just think like looking at you, even when we first met and I was like, you were telling me your journey and I was like, oh, you're like a psycho, you know, like yeah. you've got some really deep like drive going on. And, and even when you were like, I want to be a strength coach. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Dad, like, yeah. why would you do that? Like, just there's, there's a huge like burgeoning, like passion and, and purpose with you that I just, I know that I, I was leaving strength and conditioning. I was like, no, that'd be like a a ceiling on your, your, you know, brightness. So I, I still, I stick 
I still believe that that was correct. So no, I'm happy no, to see. <laughs> well, it, well, like I needed a guideline at the time because I had like I didn't have the consciousness level to like sort through that because it may like in my little tiny brain at the time it like oh this is a logical step oh whatever but like also like, I didn't realize the weight out and the stress I was picking up. Mm-hmm. At, and or lack of freedom to do x which again i love what i'm doing now in the realm because like i love i really truly love coaching in the re- essence that i've helped people and the feedback there is like it's for it's priceless in the realm of like personal development for both them and myself so again like i would have been able to get similar return but like in the world of like physiological and mindset coaching which i still would have done in the weight room I st- I just the freedom that I get and the fulfillment I get from uh helping folks with what I coach is again I'm just I'm th- this is me thanking you for that little nuance at the time <laughs> that, that I needed that book at the right time at, at, but for now like I'm donating it back but uh at, at last question um always interesting to see what kind of responses come from it though but uh the best advice you've ever been given or that you currently give damn I'm going to, I'm going to pull out some Gabby Reese advice. Let's go get, yeah. Shout out. G. I She's- just gave this, I just gave this advice and I, I was going to send her a, a message literally today. Cause I was thinking about how crazy it is that this advice stuck with me, but she basically just said, um, she was telling me how, uh, when this is so context for people listening, Gabrielle Reese, she's a basically former supermodel and professional beach volleyball player at the exact same time and now she's a just i, emo, I don't want to and i don't want to i don't want to pigeonhole either uh owner I, of I, xpt live okay let's just say that owner yeah well, well her well her podcast for those of you listening gabby reese's podcast is electric too she's just mm-hmm. she's a helper sharer leader she's an emotional black belt her awareness is high of herself and others and she just brings people together in like a really special way. Like obviously they, they have these really cool teachers of the pool training and the sauna and ice. And I've adopted a lot of their philosophy on life because it makes sense to eternally keep moving, eternally keep learning and share it along the way, which I think is rare. Cause some people, I always like the saying help and support are not yours to keep. Like they don't keep fucking anything they share. And then I, I just, I, I always try and get a dose of her mindset whenever I can, but go ahead, feed, feed me, feed me. Anyway, she's a legend. So yeah. I, so she gave me this piece of advice when I had just been hired by the Yankees and there's like this explosion of media and like craziness. And I, and there was like people talking shit on the internet like they do, like is normal. And I was talking to her about it and she was like, look, she's like, look, when I was playing beach volleyball, like she was being an athlete, using her body and being this like ferocious lioness, you know, she was like, people would come up to me with a Vogue magazine of me being this like really like modely person and they would want my autograph on this Vogue magazine because she was on the cover of Vogue and also being a, a volleyball athlete and she was like I always used to be bothered by like no I'm not that's not me like I'm I just do that for money and I'm this fierce athlete and I'm this person I'm serious and I'm doing this thing and she was like it doesn't matter like people are going to assign meaning to what you're doing that has nothing to do with you you know, and you just have to know who you are doing what you're doing. And there's, they're going to put some kind of meaning onto you. And for her, it was very tangible, right? Like they would give her the magazine to sign. And she's like, no, I'm an athlete. I'm a serious athlete. Take me seriously. And like same thing. So that's applied to me hugely, right? I'm this, I'm a serious coach, you know, like I'm, I'm just as, as serious as a heart attack really with my job. But at the same time, there's, tons of people asking for my autograph and it's these these little girls or these moms that are like I feel like the Easter bunny sometimes they're like oh you're just the best you're like my six-year-old daughter's hero and I'm like I gotta go yell at the team like I can't sign (laughs) autographs for a six-year-old and I have to be the Easter bunny and like take a picture and be happy and it's like this dual like life that I'm living and people are assigning so much meaning to what I'm doing that they don't even know what I actually do for my job, but they're assigning so much meaning to it. And so it's like this difficult of like, okay, I have to really be solid as a rock in knowing my identity so that no matter what anyone says, super hype stuff, that's like, you're this amazing hero person or whatever Easter bunny. And then also the bad stuff that comes to you that people are signing meaning or, or whatever titles or, you know, negative things to you. 
you have to be so solid as a rock and knowing who you are and being aware of your, your own thoughts, you know, and your own actions so that none of that permeates your, your emotional status. And she didn't go into that depth. She just told me the story of, of these people asking for autograph on a Vogue magazine when she was trying to be an athlete. And she was like, it doesn't, it's not about you. Like that's about them and the experience that they're having in relation to whatever you're doing. And it's not, it has nothing to do with you. So you just ignore it or you just play along and you sign the whatever. And then you're like, see you later. Okay, gotta go do my actual life over here. Because no negative or positive, nobody really knows except for you with your own thoughts and your own actions every single day. And that's all that matters. Yeah. And I, I love the simplicity of that too, where it's like, it's the what's in your control, what's out of your control. But I also, again, like it's kind of even where we started the conversation on the spectrum of human that you are. And I like, I, I take a lot of pride in it. And like, I, I used to like feel insecure if I wasn't just, just the athlete. Cause like, if I wasn't like, if it wasn't plan a, if I had a plan B I'm shortcutting plan a, and I was doing this whole spectrum. So I couldn't learn and like, ask the PTs questions because I knew stuff about, I wanted to try out these recovery methods or whatever it ended up being. But then like, eventually I embraced, like, like I, again, I use quotes and different analogies to like, keep me, myself on boundary. I call them logic landmarks, but, uh, Naval Ravikant has this awesome saying, and I've said it on the podcast before, but like, you don't go to the circus to see a bear. You don't go to the circus to see a unicycle. You go there, to see a bear ride a fucking unicycle. And like, that's how, <laughs> And I, like, it's so fucking special to be have that capability, even with G, like with Gabby, like the ability to be this lioness savage and then go be this gorgeous bathing mm -hmm. suit superstar like like that. And like and we look at it and see like entertainment and like, like yeah, like I, like I'm putting on a show and it's the show of my life. I'm I'm authentically myself. I'm capable of being this dog cuss coach but also I'll be this person on the front lines and you, mm -hmm. you already, you already the, like the, the first one through the wall is the bloodiest. Like you, you, like you got the scars to prove that. And now, and then you have, and you have the, the courage and the awareness to let go of that and evolve and now change the sport. And even just in like the structure that we talked about, like, I think that would change the sport and like tenfold if everybody could communicate or again, or people start to apply the tangible competitiveness to an environment. I think, we always like a lot of people try and reinvent the wheel and be one dimensional when really in the multivariable nature of sport and competition, which is true chaos. Cause there's so much variability to what pitch is coming next, the weather, like all these things, we're never going to master the chaos. All we can do is have the most set structure and the most capable human to again, compete with. Cause I want as much armor and weaponry to go to battle with. And it sounds like, again, I'm just a big fan, but like, it sounds like you have that in spades with the awareness to say like, Oh yeah, like I can, you can think what you think, want to think, but like, I'm still changing the fucking game and I'm changing the world, which, which you are. And, uh, I'm eternally grateful that you took the time to hop on just as a wrap up summary, but you're a stud. Well, as always, I appreciate the conversation. And I think it's, I think it's great that you're sharing all kinds of, you've got stellar guests and I'm, I think it's great. You're sharing this with the world. Hell yeah. You're, you're awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Be well.